Oh, excuse me. Just feeling a little bloated and uncomfortable over here. How about you? How's your gut health? Do you feel bloated or gassy? Not to get too personal, but how's your stool? Are you often constipated? Or maybe you're on the other end of that spectrum and you're dealing with loose stool or diarrhea. Or maybe you suffer from frequent heartburn. Or perhaps you're not sleeping well or you're dealing with skin rashes or allergies. Do you often find yourself tired and sluggish throughout the day? Or maybe you have intense sugar cravings. If any of these sound like you, these could be signs that you suffer from poor gut health. Stick around. In this episode, we're going to deep dive into the world of the gut microbiome and give you tips on how to optimize your gut in order to make all other aspects of your life better. Hello and welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Show. I'm your host, Kevin English. I'm the founder of The Silver Edge and our mission is to help you build and maintain a lean, healthy body that you love for the rest of your life. So you can show up in the second half of your life as the healthiest, strongest, most vital version of yourself. We have a great show for you today. Mark Washington and Dr. Chris Damon are here and they're going to help you heal your gut. But before we get to that, I want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Levels. Levels is my favorite protein powder. I love them for their commitment to high quality supplements with minimal ingredients. They give you all of the good stuff without any of the junk found in so many supplements today. No sugar, soy, gluten, artificial sweeteners, fillers, or proprietary blends. Their grass-fed whey is my go-to protein powder. It tastes great and is a fantastic source of clean protein. You can check them out over at silveredgepartners.com. Just click on the levels icon. And because you're a listener of this show, you can get 20% off your first order when you use the coupon code KEV20 at checkout. Again, that's silveredgepartners.com. And be sure to use coupon code KEV20. That's K-E-V as in Kevin, KEV20 at checkout. Okay, enough of that. Let's get on with today's show. My guests today are Mark Washington and Dr. Chris Damon. Mark has spent his entire adult life in the fitness and nutrition industry. He was the president and CEO of Beachbody, the CEO of Irwin Naturals, and he's currently the founder and CEO of Supergut, a business designed to help people regain control of their health by harnessing the powerful science of the gut microbiome. Dr. Chris has spent his entire adult life studying the role of the gut microbiome in its relationship to overall health and vitality. He's currently the Chief Medical and Science Officer of Supergut. Join us today as we take a deep dive into your digestive health issues. We discuss the common ailments of the gut, their causes, as well as strategies for healing your gut microbiome for optimal health. Now, before we jump into today's interview, Mark and Dr. Chris deep dive into gut healing strategies, and we talked a good bit about things like pre, pro, and postbiotics, the role of insoluble fiber, and we talk in depth about the FODMAP diet. I want to let you know that I've summarized all this information in the Over 50 Heal Your Gut Guide, and you can find that over at silveredgefree.com. So if after listening to this episode, you'd like a handy gut health primer, head over to silveredgefree.com and download that guide. And one last thing before we start the show, if after listening to this episode, you decide you want to try some of Super Guts products, you can use coupon code SILVEREDGE for 20% off your order. That's Silver Edge all run together, no spaces. Okay, let's meet today's guests. I started out by asking Mark how he got interested in gut health. Yeah, so I'm the founder of Super Gut. I've actually been in the space of health and wellness throughout my entire career. It's like my personal passion, and I've been fortunate to pattern a career in this space. So everything, food, beverage, supplements, fitness, it's my North Star. It's what gets me going is helping other people lead healthier lives, right? So that's always been there. I'd say the gut health avenue 
has come on, I'd say in the past five years or so, when thinking about how can we do something that can be even more effective relative to so many of the diets and products and even medications out there, like what can we do naturally through food to fundamentally transform people's health. That's really when I got into the science of the gut microbiome. It was really, I give a lot of credit to my seed investors, the production board, who have been researching the microbiome. It's like, listen, we'd love to back you and support you. What do you know about the science of the gut? And I was like, I'm familiar, I'm aware. And they're like, not just a probiotic here or there, but like literally the deep science, it's really profound. And it was like an awakening, like mind blowing to see just how profound the impact of your gut the microbiome is on so many different aspects and dimensions of your health. And from there, it's been no looking back. Like this is the pathway how I think we have opportunity to fundamentally change people's lives and health through, through the gut microbiome. So yeah, I'd say over the past five years or so is when I've really immersed myself into this space. I love that passion. I love that you're talking about not just maybe in incrementally improving people's lives, but you said you want to tr fundamentally transform people's lives. Absolutely. And Love that message. All right, Dr. Chris, same thing to you now. How did your journey into gut health get started? Yeah, I would say my, my foray into gut health began in the context of a medical school lecture back at Columbia. And it was before microbiome was really even a term or in vogue. I think somebody had coined the term, but nobody really knew about it back then. And it was, it was a book that was highlighted to me called Plague Times by Paul Ewald. He's an evolutionary biologist and applied those themes to medicine and disease. And it was his hypothesis that much of disease was related to microbes and not in the conventional sense of, you know, a pathogen and a disease, but these communities of microbes that exist on, within and around us, the microbiome. And it's been a wave I've just followed throughout my whole career, throughout uh, internship and residency and fellowship up until present day and, and working with Mark and colleagues at Supergut and using this perspective in order to develop healthier for you foods that can impact our health, not just eliminate disease, but improve health in, in pretty mm -hmm. fundamental ways. And it was a natural transition. I, after you know med school and residency and fellowship and actually being a, a, a young attending at the University of Washington, I, I was at the Gates Foundation for about five years leading their gut health work and we were working on foods there that impacted the microbiome. So this transition from uh, the low and middle income setting to high income setting actually was made a lot of sense. There was plenty of obesity and diabetes, even in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia. And it just seemed like a lot of the problems that we had here were being replicated around the world. And this was something that needed to be short circuited. So that's, that's my journey in a nutshell. All right. So it sounds like you're basically your entire medical career then has been <laughs> focused around the gut. Is that fair? I would say that's fair to say. I right could on. even All trace right. that yeah. back to when I was a kid and my, my family would joke that I've always been a little gut centric with my potty humor, but <laughs> so <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay, and I can vouch this. for that. That continues on. That continues on continues to, to this day. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, guys, I think let's set the table here before we dive deep into some of this. Let's talk about gut health just at a 10,000 foot view. What is it what what is it when you say gut health what are we talking about and why should people like me my, my mind is all over 50 right why why should we care so health i think conventionally people thought gut health is helping you have healthier happier bowel movements it's it's so much more than that so the gut is really kind of the gateway to health in the body truly every every molecule that exists within our cells with the exception of oxygen which we breathe in comes through the gut comes through the food that we ingest so literally you are what you eat, right? It's, it's not just a metaphor, it's, it's, it's true. And so it stands to reason that uh, our health and disease states also are directly impacted by our gut and, and the food that we eat. Not, not entirely, uh, you know, exercise and mindfulness and other things are really important too, but the gut is, is really central and key. So gut health to me means so much more than just improving your gut, it means improving your entire health, right? And, and how that impacts I mean, things like your mood and how well you sleep and maybe even things like allergy and immunity and, and metabolism. Yeah. You, Chris said it really well. Like the thing for me where it really connected was when, you know, talking about what we're doing, talking about with my mom. Right. And she's like, oh, this is interesting gut health. So it's like, you know, digestion regular. I was like, well, yes, but that's just the start. Right. I mean, and that's kind of the general perspective around gut health is digestion. And that kind of is 
the pathway, that's like first base. And that's what was so mind blowing to me when I talked about like with my mom to make it real. It's like, no, that's for sure. That's the starting point. But having a strong foundation of gut health and digestion is actually the unlock to better total health, right? So things that you care about, mom, like your blood sugar levels and managing a healthy weight and blood pressure, those things, guess what? Those are actually tied back to the health of your gut. And she's like, oh, well, I care about those, right? Okay, I get it now, right? Yeah. It makes, makes a lot of sense. So the things that you are dealing with in your life, the way I say it is almost anything, if you have an issue or a challenge or something that you're trying to get under control, odds are that there, it, it does tie back in some form or fashion to what's happening with the health of your gut. So it really is unbelievably profound and relevant, essentially for all of us. Yeah, I, I think that gut health is certainly seems to have the spotlight right now. There's a lot of focus on gut mm -hmm. health and you guys have both mentioned microbiome several times. So I think before we go on, let's talk about microbiome because we hear that thrown around a lot. Oh my gut microbiome. It turns out we have microbiomes all over on and in our bodies, but the gut microbiome seems to be the, I think, is that fair to say that's the largest microbiome in our body? Um, talk to us a little bit of what, what is a microbiome and let's talk a little bit about the, the care and feeding of a healthy microbiome. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. So the gut does seem to be in vogue and, you know, Jenny, my wife, my girls joke and they say, dad, you've been talking about this stuff, you know, <laughs> ever since I've been born or ever since we got married. Uh, but now their friends and family are starting to say, Hey, you know, what, what's the deal with gut health and what's the deal with microbiome? So it's, it's actually kind of fun to, to see that all come full circle, but mm -hmm. and what is, what is microbiome? It's, it's a term that's really entered the, the, the lay lexicon, right? Everyone's using it now, but what does it really mean? And your question is the gut microbiome, the biggest, it depends on how you measure it. But certainly the most organisms are present in the gut in really high density. So one might say, yeah, that, that, that could be true, but we've got microbes on our skin and our lungs and, you know, just every, in our everywhere mouth you and, get in your yeah, mouth. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. absolutely. And so what, what are these bugs? Now, some might say that it's actually, we're holo organisms. So it's not just our cells, but it's how we interact with the entirety of the world and the biology, the biosphere. And this is just sort of one microcosm of that. You know, we, what is we, what is us, you know, maybe it's microbes and our cells. And, and what are they doing? Well, they serve maybe two major functions. They're certainly doing a lot, but one function is to protect us from, from bad guys. So there's plenty of pathogens, viruses, and bacteria out there, and, and they play a really important role directly and indirectly through our immune system in modulating it to protect us. But the other really fundamental role that they play is in helping transform the food that we eat that truly we can't ourselves transform. So we have digestive enzymes that our pancreas makes and that we secrete into the small intestine that helps break down things like carbohydrates and proteins and fats. But there are some things that we can't digest and those are indigestible fibers. And, and those fibers, those things we can't digest, the microbes help us with. And they turn the, the things we can't digest into molecules that are uh, absolutely critical for us. In some cases, B vitamins, as well as these things called short chain fatty acids like butyrate, which are really important for the immune system and metabolism and actually cognition. Yeah. I think Chris said it well, like when you think about this, this microbiome, like think of it like these hosts of what Chris described, these trillions of tiny microorganisms that the one that we talk about, right? The ones that reside in your gut, in your digestive tract, small intestine, but largely in your large intestine, in your, in your colon. Yeah, and obviously that's a big part of what we focus on at Supergut is feeding those bugs, right? I mean, there's a lot of talk about gut health and there's different ways to maintain a healthy gut. Many people focus on a probiotic or a, a pill or what have you. And there's some evidence, you know, I think there's still some room to go in terms of how much that's actually doing. We focus on, and you know, it's kind of fundamentally back to that belief, you are what you eat, like Chris described. We really focus on how do you feed yourself and how do you feed those bugs that are responsible for keeping you healthy. And the key is something that's been just fundamentally missing from our diets, which we've all heard about for years and years. It just comes back to it's fiber, <laughs> in particular, prebiotic fiber that you need to be getting more of in your diet to actually feed those trillions of bugs that are responsible for keeping you healthy. And that's obviously what we focus on at Supergut. 
Gotcha. So the key, the key here is how do we feed those bugs? I just want to stay on the bugs here for a minute because I think this is fascinating. I've, I've heard it said somewhere that there are more cells or organisms inside our body that are external to us than are actually us. So in other words, I have all these organ cells and skin cells and all of these cells, probably trillions of cells that make up Kevin, but there's trillions of these other bugs, as you guys are calling them. And what you guys are saying is, hey, we need to recognize that these guys are here. We have this symbiotic relationship with them. And it's in our best interest to really care about feed and caring for these guys. Is that a fair way of saying that? It's really well put, Kevin. Okay, very, very great. well put. Just what, yeah. All right. So, yeah, we've got all, we have all these visitors with us. They're with us for life here. And we, we want to make sure that they are well taken care of so that we are well taken care of. Because like you said, it's not so much that digestion is just, hey, we're going to eat this food and then we're going to eliminate this food and you're going to extract some nutrients. That is a big piece of it. But I think you had referenced and we'll probably pick some of this apart later, but some immune system type things that are also going on there. But before we start picking some of this apart a little bit, what are some of the most the most common gut problems? What happens when we're in dysbiosis or when we have this dysregulation of these bugs in our gut? Well, the, the obvious answer is our bowel habits are changed. And so, you know, people may experience looser stools or frank diarrhea or constipation on the opposite end of the spectrum. But I, you know, hearkening back to the earlier conversation, wouldn't leave it there. And it may be that some sleep disturbances, some mood disturbances, some metabolic disturbances and immune disturbances are actually directly related to imbalances in the microbes in our gut. And th these are all areas of active investigation with tens of papers coming out every month, if not week on, on some of these topics. And we're surely learning a lot more in this area, but I do think we'll look back on the next two decades of nutrition research, which uh, there will be a lot of unlocks within the microbiome uh, intersection with nutrition and realize just how fundamental some of these themes are that we've been perhaps missing in our approach to nutrition historically. And I think a lot, a lot of chronic disease may actually come into focus and come clear what has been fueling, you know, literally the epidemic of, of non-communicable disease like obesity and diabetes. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, like Chris said, a lot of the times when you say what is a sign of an unhealthy gut, like the first sign, again, might go back to the first area that is affected by gut health, right? Is digestion, right? I mean, so whether it's regularity or, you know, diarrhea or bloating or nausea, those things can be kind of leading indicators that there's something happening in your gut. Also, I mean, because you didn't mention things like inflammation, right? I mean, so like having a strong gut barrier and potentially leaky gut kind of, you know, uh, allowing things to permeate through that aren't supposed to be like in your bloodstream. Those kind of things can show up in a poignant, acute way. So a lot of times it starts there, but just like this conversation, like gut health being tied to everything, it can be metabolic conditions, right? I mean, insulin response being out of whack, right? I mean, inability to maintain healthy weight, things of those nature, cholesterol levels, elevated blood pressure, those actually can be tied and connected back to your gut. So even though you might not directly connect them, right? I mean, given this fact that your gut is your foundation for better overall health, overall health, those also can be signs that the gut is actually at the root cause and potentially the solution to some of those metabolic health conditions beyond just those digestive issues that you might be facing. Okay. Yeah. I, I love this conversation because we're always looking for ways, not just to be not sick, but to really optimize our right. health, right? To be yeah. really to perform as we want to go to beast mode as we're going in our 50s, 60s and 70s, right? <laughs> but, but we don't want to buy into that. It's all downhill from here. And certainly by taking care of our gut, we can take care of our overall metabolic health. Now, what about things like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, SIBO, some of these other, you know, we just have people sometimes say, I, you know, I have gas, I have bloating. Clearly these are signs of some dysregulation, but what about like the, the small intestine bacterial overgrowth and the IBS and the Crohn's and some of these more serious things are, how are they tied into gut health? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're absolutely tied into gut health and we're, we're learning about the different inputs to things like SIBO and IBS and, you know, even as you mentioned, Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease, which are 
very different from those first two, which, you know, there's inflammation, even frank bleeding sometimes with the IBD versus IBS. But we're learning that the, the fibers that we eat are probably really important for a lot of these GI conditions and not all fiber is created equal. So some fibers may actually fuel these problems. And, and these would be fibers that tend to fall into what's called the FODMAPs, the high FODMAPs. These are the highly fermentable fibers, tend to be fermented more in the upper gut, maybe where they shouldn't be fermented rather than in the lower gut in the colon. And then there's other fibers that are just that, they're they're fermented in the colon, maybe where they should be and are making these really important factors like butyrate and B vitamins and other things. Gotcha, okay, so, and you had mentioned FODMAP there and folks may or may not be aware Mm -hmm. of low FODMAP diets and things like this. And certainly if you've had gut problems in the past, you may have tried that. So let's pick that apart a little bit. You had mentioned that these are mentable fibers, right? So let's, let's go ahead and dive into fibers. We've talked about fibers a little bit here. I think most of our, most of our folks growing up, we've, you know, certainly in the in the seventies and eighties, hey, eat your fiber. The food pyramid was eat, eat your prunes, ser- eat your twelve <laughs> servings of yeah, yeah cereals yeah. and grains and prunes and things yeah. like that, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So, what's the big deal about fiber? And you had mentioned right there that there's different kinds of fibers. Some that's not serving our gut health so well, and some that are fabulous for gut health. So let's dive into some of that. Mm. And it it really depends on the individual too. So mm-hmm. you know, some people can have FODMAPs just fine and they have no issue. And it probably has to do with the specific communities of microbes that are present in their gut and where they're present, Hmm. whether there might be some overgrowth, right? And small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in the upper gut or imbalances in the upper gut that predispose to fermenting these fibers faster and higher in the gut. But the, the fibers that fall into the high FODMAP category, this stands for uh, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. So there you have it. I'm glad we have glad, a doctor on the I'm show. I'm so yeah. glad you didn't ask me that. <laughs> yeah, right? So it's super Thank simple. You. you know, yeah. you just, you follow that regimen and you'll be fine. No. <laughs> right? Um, no, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And, you know, if, if you suspect you might have IBS that's related to high FODMAPs, it actually is super helpful talking with a nutritionist because they know this area well and can really give you some good advice and guidance and, and how to navigate your own specific personalized gut because it is about finding which triggers you have. And that's what elimination diets help you with. And that's you know what a, a registered dietitian could be really helpful with. But it just... I I want to jump in and interrupt you real quick. Just to be very clear, a FODMAP diet is, in fact, a type of elimination diet, right? We are going to take these high FODMAP foods out, usually for a, a period of time, 30, 60, 90 days. Is that fair? And then start to bring foods back in. But it, it's my understanding that really what we want to do by doing this isn't so much as live the rest of our life not eating high FODMAP foods, but trying to restore the gut so that a healthy gut will accept these for most people, right? Mm-hmm. In the end, is is that fair? You just stole the words right out of my mouth. Okay. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of the more intractable problems, I think, that we have in society because we've been eating such an impoverished diet when it comes to the prebiotics for microbes for so long, not to mention other things like you know, antibiotics, which are incredibly useful when they're needed, but may be overprescribed, overused, you know, birth practices like C-section, again, incredibly useful, but there's double-edged source of these breastfeeding mm-hmm. versus formula feeding, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses here, but all these things impact the diversity of our gut. So how the heck do we restore it? Um, you know, there's some fascinating work using fermented foods uh, out of Stanford and Justin mm-hmm. Sonnenberg's lab that have shown you can restore diversity with these foods. And it's not what you think. It's not that the microbes in those foods are jumping in, but it's that fermented food is almost serving as a prebiotic to help all of the native bugs in your gut, the good the good guys went out and grow more. So that's maybe one way that we can help restore. The other thing to think about is if you can find those fibers that you can tolerate and the low FODMAP fibers tend to be the ones that are more tolerable. And those would be things like you know, resistant starch and arabinoxylin and beta glucan and pectins and, and things like that. Yeah. So, okay. Here's, just, wait, I, I want to... 
What, yeah, hang on, just because you you do some big words there. <laughs> let's let's talk about. Can you give me some examples? Give our listeners some examples. What would some examples of high FODMAP foods be versus low FODMAP foods? Yeah, so one of the big culprits. So there are many different FODMAPs and categories. The you know categories that were mentioned, those big words. But one of one of the categories are fructans or fructooligosaccharides and. Okay, that's that's more big words. also big words. <laughs> what are these foods? It's th- those are they tend to be foods that come from allium. So that's garlic and onions. And it's it's a curious thing if you look at a lot of packaged foods, processed foods at the ingredient list, you'll often see onion powder and garlic powder listed, and those seem incredibly innocuous, but folks that have IBS and that suffer from intolerance to to FODMAPs that can be bad news bears. <laughs> and, yeah. and a lot of people don't realize that, oh, that's the natural ingredient should be fine. But that tends to be one of the big culprits. So if if you do find yourself suffering from IBS, that's one little gut check you can do when looking at ingredients. And, and Chris, okay. is it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the type of the fiber that's found in those or a high FODMAP, isn't inulin like one of those key classes of those high FODMAP fibers that's found across garlic and onions and artichokes and things. So it's not necessarily bad per se, but if you are someone that has digestive tolerance issues, those can be culprits that could flip, you know, make things flare up. So inulin, which is out there quite a bit, is and directionally it's good for you, but even the average person that doesn't have IBS and so forth can still only tolerate so much of it, right? Because it really does ferment kind of quickly throughout your digestive tract versus the low FODMAP types, which, you know, Chris can describe more what some of those are. But I think people might be a little bit surprised, right? Because they're probably, we're expecting you to say, oh, these are, these are chemicals that are engineered and they're find yeah. they're found in, in this ultra processed foods, which those, those certainly are a part of the high food map foods. But the first food you mentioned was actually what many people would consider a very healthy food. Oh, onion, I've heard that's a superfood or garlic. Isn't that good for you? So yes and no, right? These are nuanced conversations that exactly typically take these types of conversations to understand and understanding that everybody's a bio individual. Certainly our guts are very individual. So yeah. So thank you for that. Now, what about, what's an example of say a low food? FODMAP food that people would be pretty safe to eat if they were experiencing some of these gut issues? Yeah. So categories of low FODMAP fibers would be resistant starch, beta-glucan, rabinose island. Some of the foods that these can be found in would be oats, beans, which have a different fiber in them as well. And some people react to that that other fiber, but, you know, green bananas tend to have a lot of resistant mm-hmm. starch. Any carb that has been cooked and then cooled uh, tends to have resistant starch. And that's because when the starch cools, it forms a gel. And that gel becomes more impervious to our enzymes and becomes more resistant to digestion and tends to pass through the gut more intact to the lower gut to provide food for our, our microbiome. So mom was right when she was making me eat the oatmeal, right? And then we had the mm-hmm. rice pudding for mm-hmm. dessert. We had the potato salads. These are cooled starches, green yeah. bananas. So all these very prebiotic rich foods. All right. So I, I think, I, I'm sorry, I, I cut you off just because you had mentioned FODMAPs and used a bunch of big words. And, and certainly I'll put in the show notes some more information regarding FODMAPs and low FODMAP diets and charts so that you guys can check those out there. But you were going to tell us, I think we were talking about just the criticality of fiber, the different types of fibers and their role in optimal health. Yeah. Well, I was, I was just going to say something at the highest level. So I, I, you know, obviously I can translate from Chris and he knows this at a deeper level and some of the big words, the way I think about it is like all fiber is good. Like we all need more fiber, but like Chris said, not all fiber is created equal. And there's different types of fiber that have both different impacts on tolerability, which I think we've been talking about low FODMAP, high FODMAP. There's also like different impacts and what they do for you and how much they're going to do for you as well. Right. I mean, so soluble fiber, which, you know, helps slow digestion, right. Versus insoluble fiber, which helps from regulation, like bulkier stools and viscous fiber, which really, you know, also has a, a gut line impact and all of them have beneficial properties but there are different kind of benefits from from all of them i'd say the other thing is it tends to be the better they are at resisting digestion at least what i've seen the more 
foundational impact that they can have, like the more that they're likely to produce some of these really important byproducts, these short chain fatty acids that you really, really want produced in your gut, circulating through your blood to tap into these different mechanisms in your body. So there's fiber's great. Awesome. Just be thoughtful about which type of fiber based on what you need in your life, both from a digestibility, tolerability, as well as from a functional standpoint. Absolutely. Well, let's let's go back. I want to circle back on something because, Chris, you had mentioned that we're not getting th these prebiotic fibers in our diet as much these days as maybe we were once upon a time. And I want to poke that apart a little bit. I'm kind of curious. Why do you think that is? Yeah, it, it's a it's a really good question, Kevin. And it's a question that has many layers to the answer. Forgive the onion pun, but unintentional. Just sort of happens in the moment sometimes as Mark can attest to. <laughs> but so there's just changes in our preferences for foods. And there's also the practice of processing. And we can trace this all the way back to hundred plus years ago when we discovered that the shelf stability, that you know, how, how long a food lasts before it spoils considerably in wheat and rice when you remove the bran. Uh, and hence, you know, we had white rice and white flour, and, and these were incredibly impactful and transformative for food insecurity a hundred years ago, you know, technologies that were transformational, but as technology, powerful technology often is the case, it, it also has this other side mm -hmm. of maybe contributing to metabolic disease because those the brand has fiber, the brand has B vitamins, the brand has phytonutrient, the brand has good fats, and that's been taken out. Now to add to that more recently, there's been a lot of ultra processing and that's taken processing to really the next level where the natural balance of nutrients within food is being shifted. And these are, you know, golden ratios that have existed since the beginning of human evolution, and we've evolved block and step with them in plants. So I ultra processing and, and removing of fibers, perhaps even more and phytonutrients and the good fats and all these other things, in addition to the sort of traditional processing of taking bran out are both leading to having less fiber in our diet overall. And, and can I put a point on what Chris said just to, to, to size this issue, right? So, so there's a lot of clinical research. There's a lot of evidence about how much of this we used to get in our diets and how much we should be getting in our diets today, right? It, it varies individual, like men versus female, but on average, the daily recommended minimum amount of fiber in your diet is about 30 grams a day, right? Here's the stats. 5% of adults in this country get the minimum amount of fiber. Wow. That, none of us, like literally wow. none of yeah. us, right? To size just how big of an issue this is, this is generally called the fiber gap, right? And I think both Chris and I, like we absolutely fundamentally believe that this gap, right, is so significantly implicated in the health of our society today, right? The fact that none of us get enough fiber in our diets is so pervasive impact. And now we know why. It's not just, again, back to digestion. We know that this is your foundation for health, right? So we think that that is a significant cause. But on the flip side, being very solution-oriented, we also think that's the solution. That's the pathway, right? Let's fill this gap. Let's level set everyone with filling this fiber gap, level setting gut health and creating a better foundation for health. Again, not just for disease, not just for disease treatment, but prevention, living your best, healthiest life. Right. And it really right is on. this fiber gap. So, yeah. The fiber gap. Okay. So that brings us, I suppose, to your company here, right? Super gut. That's what you guys are attempting to do, right? You're trying yeah. to fill this fiber gap. I had I had not heard that statistic before that 90% of us are not getting the minimum requirement. 95. 95% <laughs> of us yes. are not getting the yeah. minimum requirement of daily fiber. So that begs the question, what do we do? How do, how do, we, yeah. how do we fix that? How do we plug up that fiber gap? Yeah, so this is something I'm really, really passionate about. My overall take is we need to do it in a way that makes it very accessible, easy, convenient, and dare I say, even enjoyable to do so, right? The old adage of just eat 
whole foods, plant foods, kind of eat less, run more, etc. We've been trying that forever. It's, it's all well intended and accurate, but not effective. I mm. think in order to actually close this gap, we, as you call it, the food industry, the nutrition industry, the health industry, we need to make it so that it's accessible, right? And like I said, even enjoyable for people to make healthier decisions in their lives, right? And so we try to do that through food. And we try to create foods that are that are powered by significant dosages, highly concentrated, a very effective, but also easily digest or tolerable sources of prebiotic fibers and we try to put that into delicious foods like shakes and bars and now we also offer our unique prebiotic fiber blend as a standalone that you could just add to anything that you can mix it in right and so this is we'd spend a lot of time on the clinicals on the science to make sure that this is really functional that we're getting large amounts large dosages of these fibers in through our products but we spend equal if not even more time on how do we make them delicious right i mean this is not good enough yeah. to just be a shake with a ton of fiber and somebody holds their nose and just drink it because it's good for you right i mean that's just not gonna work we're like we spend a lot of time to make, let's make this the best tasting shake like on the market and it's almost a shock that it has 20 grams of fiber in there which is crazy right i mean most shakes have two or three grams of fiber we've got 20 it's the first ingredient right on the label same with our bars right we've got 10 grams of this really potent resistant starch prebiotic fiber blend in our bars but people eat them because they're delicious they they continue to eat them because they're delicious right they they really love them and then with our with our blend they're like wow i can get those benefits but i can actually make my own you know gut health superfood i can mix it in a coffee or oatmeal or make my own smoothie or what have you right we want to make that that versatile so so it's all with this thesis of how do we make it easy and convenient so that somebody doesn't have to go way out of their way to fill this fiber gap, to kind of reorient their gut health in a, in a positive direction. So yeah, as you can tell I get, I'm really passionate about this because I think this yeah. is so critical to, to solving like what I think is this public health crisis that we're, that we're in. I'll say like, like Mark, I'm, I'm a pragmatist. I will say number one, two, and three, if I'm talking with a patient, whole foods, right? That's, you know, nature's way of delivering foods. And we should really emphasize that, but like Mark, a lot of that advice has fallen on deaf ears for the last several decades. And, you know, maybe there's more innovative ways that we can approach whole foods and there's apps and such that are maybe making some headway there. But I think a really important part of the overall solution is exactly what Mark was articulating and what the company embodies. And, and that is almost in a biohacking way, identify those key things that are missing in, in processed foods. There's, there's certainly some things in processed foods that probably shouldn't be there. And that's another part of the discussion, but there's truly things that are missing as well. And so if we can understand which of those things are missing and put them back in and deliver foods that are convenient, tasty, and familiar, uh, to the modern palate that may not be all that different from the current processed foods. They're just better for you. It's the 70, 30 rule rather get some of that in than none of that in that's, that's where I become a pragmatist. And I say, yeah, there's, there's a huge role here for what Mark and, and we are doing at, at super gut. This is, you know, why I signed on. Yeah. Right, right on. Look, Hey, I, as a nutrition coach, I, I hear what you're saying. I, my first advice to all of my clients is let's get as many nutrients and many mm -hmm. calories as we can from real whole healthy foods. Mm -hmm. Let's pay mm -hmm. attention to that. But Chris, like you said, I'm also a pragmatist. And I know that if I'm telling somebody, especially I had read a statistic somewhere that I think the average American's diet is made up of 75% processed and ultra processed foods. And to ask somebody to overnight change that is an unrealistic expectation, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a mm -hmm. recipe for failure is what it is, right? Exactly. But if we take these small gradual steps, right, towards doing, making healthier choices, but then just because we live in this new reality of convenient, ultra processed, ultra delicious, or right. hyper palatable, right. I yeah, think yeah. is the, is the word that the food industry uses, Absolutely. these hyper palatable foods, that's what we're eating mostly. And if you guys can come in, shore that up with healthy alternatives that, like you said, it's, hey, this is tasty, it's convenient, and oh, by the way, it's got a whole bunch of these prebiotic insoluble fibers that we are so desperately missing. Absolutely love that. So 
I think that's fantastic. And folks can check that out. Again, I'll, I'll drop all of this in the, in the show notes, but that's over at supergut.com, right? That's yes, right. So guys, I, I want to shift gears just a little bit. So people are hearing a whole lot here. We've just talked, we just talked on and on and on about prebiotics and ports of prebiotic fibers. A lot of folks are probably more familiar with probiotics. And mm -hmm. we mentioned those a little bit earlier. Talk about the difference between prebiotics, probiotics, and the role maybe of each of those. Sure. Yeah. So simply put, probiotics are microbes and they're microbes that eat prebiotics. And most of the probiotics that you find in the market are derived from food and, and derived from what were originally fermented foods that truthfully have their own microbiome associated with them. These really complex communities of many different types of microbes, just like our gut, just different types of microbes from our gut. And the probiotics that you find on the market are sort of hand-selected individual species from those overall communities. And, and there's been a lot of research done on them. And for specific conditions, probiotics work to a certain degree and guidelines support that, like traveler's diarrhea to prevent that when you're traveling taking Pepto-Bismol or probiotics has been shown to be effective. When I advise my patients whether to take probiotics or not, I tend to just recommend fermented foods because that has really the entire complement of, of probiotics and all of the, to enter another term into the lexicon, postbiotics, not to confuse things too much, but those, those are all the little molecules that the microbes are making, the probiotics are making from the prebiotics. So yeah, I tend to, if, if probiotics enter into the conversation, focus folks on the diversity of fermented foods available, but I, I tend to be a believer in maybe the, the importance, or if you had to rank things in terms of importance of prebiotics and that if you feed them, they will come uh, concept, you will pull all of those minority members out of your gut and turn them into majority members if you give them the right food. It's not completely the case. Some people have these bleached coral reefs in their gut. If you can imagine that visual analogy and you can put as much fish food as you want on that gut and that bleached reef and it's not gonna come back. And there's companies that are coming up with solutions a lot more sophisticated than just over-the-counter probiotics for, for solving that. But I think for the general consumer, the general population, prebiotics, prebiotic foods can be incredibly impactful. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll say something maybe a little bit controversial. <laughs> like when you look at the many of the over-the-counter probiotics that are just available out there, there is limited evidence that most of them are actually serving the function and having a benefit at the end of the day. There is absolutely good research around different strains and different you know, applications and intervention that have been shown to have some benefit, but when you actually look at just a over-the-counter pill, generic probiotic, just think about it, right? It's a live organism, or it's at least intended to be a live organism to add to your colony, to your microbiome, which has trillions of live organisms. It's actually a rough path to go from a store shelf. It has to be alive. It has to be in a format that can be ingestible. It has to survive the digestive tract. It has to you know, pass through your stomach and all the enzymes. And it has to reside into your gut to actually have the in, any intended benefit. And is it the right strain? Is it the right amount? And did it survive? And all these different paths, it's actually not easy, right? And so what I have seen and learned is that a lot of the over-the-counter probiotics aren't necessarily having the full intended benefit. So you have to do your research. Prebiotics, on the other hand, you know you have, for the vast majority, have a good colony, have a nice coral reef of bugs that are right in your gut, that are inherent, that are in you, like that are meant to do the good thing if well-fed. So even if you have a good probiotic, probiotics, those bugs, they still need to be fed, like under all circumstances. And so you still can't get around the fact that you need the prebiotics, the nourishment, the food for those good bugs in your gut to do their job. So... Got it. So probiotics are our bugs and prebiotics is the food that we're feeding exactly. to really nourish these healthy bugs. And it's some examples of probiotic foods would be things like any fermented food, right? Your, your kimchi and your sauerkrauts, your, I suppose, yogurts and all the fermented forms of mm -hmm. dairy, things of that nature, right? Yes. All right. So let's shift gears yet again. Let's talk a little bit about the gut and the role of stress and sleep. And specifically, I'm wondering 
if I have a healthy gut, is that improving my ability to cope with stress and sleep? Or is it the inverse? If I improve my sleep and reduce my stress, there's some stress reduction strategies, am I improving my gut? What's the relationship there between those things? Great question. Well, you asked Chris, the I'll let you take. age old question of the chicken or the egg. Yes, I am. My, my favorite <laughs> answer to that yeah. is yes. And includes yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> exactly. <I love> it. <laughs> Where there's a debate, there's two sides that often have good points. And you know, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And that's that's true as well for what you could call the gut brain connection, you know, distilled down to its essence. And sleep does impact the gut. And the gut does impact sleep. And it's a two-way road. It's a two-way highway with several different lines of communication between the two, including neurons and hormones and immune system. They're, they're all playing a really important role in connecting the dots between the gut and the brain. There's been some fascinating research, largely still in, in model organisms that bear out just how profound this connection is. And one study that I find incredibly fascinating is a study looking at the surrogate or the equivalence of, of mood, if you, if you could attribute you know, a depressed mood to a rodent. And they delivered certain strains of probiotics to these mice and that mood behavior changed. And then they took it one step further and alluded to the neurons that connect the brain and the gut. There's, there's one collection of neurons called the vagus nerve and they snipped it. They snipped that vagus nerve and the effect of the probiotics vanished. They didn't work anymore. So it was a really elegant sort of reductionist approach to showing this highway that exists between the gut and the brain. It goes the other way too. Like if you don't mm -hmm. get sleep and you're stressed, we all have experienced the, the indigestion. We might get sort of bloated. We might actually have looser stools. I can remember back to college and, and before test where you both are not sleeping because you're studying for it and you're anxious about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I can personally attest to that impacting my gut. It's an N of one experiment, but that counts for something. And this has been studied more rigorously in the literature. So yeah, I, th I think it's very much a two-way highway. It's a, it's a yes to your question, a resounding yes. For sure. And to take it beyond just at the clinical, at the mouse and the model level, like the science is really emerging. It's really fascinating. This gut brain axis is bidirectional. So even in our clinical study that we conducted on super gut, obviously we're focused on metabolic health outcomes and quality of life. But Chris really designed it to really look across these different dimensions as well to see where else might we see signals of improvement. And in our study, we saw real improvement in some of these areas which are connected to this gut-brain axis, right? Even beyond the metabolic health improvements and the quality of life. So things like sleep quality improved for those that were consuming, you know, super gut continuously, energy levels, mood, brain fog, right? All of these are kind of indications or implications of this connection between what's happening in your gut and your overall mental mental health as well. So we saw signals of these. Obviously, we would need to run a clinical study differently to focus on you know, statistically validating that connection, but we saw very positive improvements in these areas, even when it wasn't the primary focus of what we were looking at for our own clinical study. So it's, it's, it's real. Yeah, the, the gut is a fascinating, fascinating subject. I've, I've heard the gut referred to as a second brain and that it can receive outside stimuli and make decisions based on that. And certainly there's the gut brain connection you guys have just talked about. They're doing crazy things with things like fecal transplants. I mean, there's just all this new, it seems to be just this renaissance of gut science now coming out, all of how important our gut is. And I think that given the statistic, like you guys had said, that only 5% of us are getting the minimum, not the optimal, but the minimum amount of these insoluble fibers. I, I just applaud you guys for bringing this to our attention and obviously for you know serving that market. So guys, as we're starting to wrap up here, what's next for you? What's next for you guys personally, as well as what's next for Supergut? What's on the horizon? 
Yeah, my my wife would test. Those are pretty intrinsically t- tied together when you're bet, yeah. when you're a startup entrepreneur. Like the the life of the company is like your it's it's your baby. Mm-hmm. It's your it's your lifeblood. You know, I think it's for me it's it's back to the the north star of what we're trying to do in the world, right? And trying to actually have a positive impact on public health and creating easy options. And so we think that we've got real solutions already that have a significant amount of room to grow and for to help more and more people. But we also have this vision of, you know, this could be a, a, a platform, right? I mean, and it's not just limited to shakes and bars or even a powder, but this long range vision of a functional food platform. What if, you know, the other favorite foods that you like to consume in your daily life also had a gut healthy version of those that actually reintroduce those missing nutrients that Chris had described that have been stripped out of them. That's a future that I love, right? I mean, so it's multiple ways for, to make it easy for people to get these nutrients, especially like these prebiotic fibers back into their diets. I feel like we have a role to play in that future. And I think obviously we do that. We actually have a shot at, at, at that aspiration, right? Actually having a meaningful impact on, on public health. So that's kind of what I get excited about. That's why I get, get excited coming into work every, every day. I feel like we can have a, have a role in, in that. I, I love it. I share that excitement with Mark. What gets me up in the morning, um, maybe even keeps me up at night because <laughs> I'm so excited is, is this possibility for impact in a, in a really profound way. Like, you know, short circuiting metabolic disease. And I think that's possible. I really do. And I think the solutions are not as complicated as one might think initially. And and adding back some of these key ingredients is probably a really important piece of that. The other part that gets me excited about the future is, you know, we've shown in a rigorous trial that these fibers impact metabolic disease. And we didn't talk so much about that trial, but that's published now. Um, but, and, and Mark alluded to this, that the, the study showed some signals in the gut brain axis with sleep and with mood and mental clarity. I'd love to explore that further, validate that more. And that can happen through just little pilots that we've done historically at the company, just small studies. But it can also happen in a bigger way, working with experts in those fields that see the potential for impact in their specific area of interest in their patients. And I think working with uh, clinicians, researchers in some of these other areas and so-called investigator initiated type trials is a future that I'm excited about. Absolutely love it. Yeah, I, I, it's almost like we've come full circle. You guys opened up, Mark. I think you said, "Hey, I, I want to fundamentally transform lives here," and that's kind of where we're mm-hmm. ending, right? This is this is big yeah. picture. It's not just so much, "Hey, I, I, I want to make some. I got a startup. I want to sell some right, supplements." Right. Uh-huh. You, you can you can hear in the way that you guys talk about it, and you're talk about your your north star. Absolutely love all of that. All right, guys. In closing, here, how can people? get in touch with you? How can they connect with you and learn more? Yeah, absolutely. So the best place is on our website is at supergut.com. I will say we're also very active on social media as well, in particular, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook as well with at supergut, where we try to continue to put out, in addition to having our products, which obviously you can come and try out, we try to be very content and education oriented as well, just like this conversation, right? To provide more in depth around the research or behind gut health and prebiotic fibers and resistant starch, how it works, our clinical study. And so we do a lot of that both on our website as well as across social media as well. So yeah, I hope people will come, come check us out. All right. Sounds good. And folks, I will drop links to all of that in the show notes so you can find that there, including all of the, uh, all of the social media links. Mark, Chris, I want to thank you guys both so much for coming on the show, sharing your time, your wisdom, your knowledge, and your passion with us. It's obvious that listening to you guys speak. You're very passionate about this subject and certainly wish you all the best in all your future endeavors. Thanks so much. It was great. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for having us on, Kevin. Kevin, I, the, the pleasure is mutual. And truth be told, it's it's work that you're doing that is equally impactful because you're getting the word out there. And so grateful for the opportunity to come on the show. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, that's our show for today, folks. As a reminder, you can download the Over 50 Heal Your Gut Guide over at silveredgefree.com. 
I'll put links to everything we talked about today in the show notes, and you can find that over at silveredgefitness.com slash 173. As we wrap up our time together today, you can show your support for this show in two important ways. One is to tell a friend about this podcast and encourage them to give it a listen. The second is for you YouTube folks to click the like and subscribe buttons and for you podcast folks to consider giving this podcast a five-star review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on and be sure to subscribe and follow so you don't miss future episodes. I really appreciate you spending your time with me today and until next time, stay strong. Stay strong.